Good morrow, gentle folk. Thanks for joining me for another episode of ARFCOM News. If you're at home right now, consider casting this episode to your smart TV. Or, if you're in a waiting room, make friends and meet new people by doing the same. Playing content on large screens pleases the algorithmic gods, and I'm even prettier at actual size. This week, I try to figure out why the ATF keeps changing their mind about pistol braces, I'll tell you why the GOA has reported Facebook to the Federal Elections Commission, and I'll show you the FBI report that proves fists are more deadly than scary black rifles. Plus, lots of other stories, but first I want to tell you about the wholesome, non-GMO, sustainably sourced, free-range, cruelty-free, gluten-free, zero-trans fat, low-carb, vegan night vision products offered to you by our friends at TNVC.com, just like mom used to make. If you like seeing stuff more than not seeing stuff, take a look at our sponsor, TNVC.com, your source for quality night vision gear to make you the bump in the night. Okay, so the big giant news this week is the BATFE reversing their reversal of their reversed opinion on pistol braces, or at least the brace on the Q Honey Badger. I heard this news right as I was setting up to record last week, so I didn't have time to ruminate on it myself or hear smart people opinions. Since then, I've heard opinions up plenty, and I think I've got my head around this enough to report on it. Of course, right after you recorded that segment, ATF changed their mind again. I am Jack's complete lack of surprise. So as of right now, they're not rescinding the cease and desist order, but they're not going to be enforcing it for the next 60 days. Sounds like somebody at the Boston branch stepped in it and Home Office wants to review. Back to you, sweetie pie. Back in August, F Troop sent a letter to QLLC advising the BATFE considered the Honey Badger, Sugar Weasel, and Mini Fix to be short-barreled rifles, and that letter was recently published by Q after they unsuccessfully attempted to work things out with ATF. In typically inscrutable fashion, the faceless and unaccountable bureaucrats explained their reasoning by saying simply, the objective design features of the Honey Badger firearm configured with the subject stabilizing brace indicate the firearm is designed and intended to be fired from the shoulder. I find that answer vague and unconvincing. This naturally led to a lot of speculation in the gun nerd world. Some folks got distracted by a section of the letter which references the marketing for the Sugar Weasel and Minifix, thinking the opinion has something to do with marketing. That isn't what the letter said, though. The letter says the Firearms and Ammunition Technology Division physically examined the Honey Badger to arrive at their opinion, but they helpfully noticed the Sugar Weasel and Mini Fix shown on Q's website also seem to have the same objective design features that indicate the Honey Badger is designed for firing from the shoulder. Whatever those objective design features might be, they didn't say what those features are or that their decision has anything to do with how the guns were marketed. It is literally just the ATF saying, Hey, we think the Honey Badger is an SBR, and oh, by the way, we also saw these other guns on your website, and we think they might be too, but we haven't physically examined them. The Fed boys really didn't tell us why they think these braces are really stocks, but each of the guns manufactured has a different brace on it. All three braces are manufactured by SB Tactical. What is it about these braces that make them verboten while other pistol braces are still presumably legal? It's entirely possible this letter signals yet another reversal in the ATF's fickle history of opinions on pistol braces, but based on this letter, which is the only evidence we can look at right now, it sounds like they aren't changing their collective mind on pistol braces in general. So what makes these braces different? The only thing I can see, and this is highly speculative, is the part of the brace which is intended to loop around the arm seems to be smaller and more angular than on some other braces. That could make it less comfortable to shoot one-handed as designed. If that's the case though, then the CAC shockwave brace could be next in line, and if my entirely made up reasoning happens to be right, that would be a ridiculously subjective standard. There really isn't anything else that stands out to me about these braces on these Q products that's different from other braces, though. Then again, maybe I'm missing the point. Maybe F Troop wasn't just being vague. This letter isn't an indictment. They won't ever have to defend it in court and prove their reasoning. It has no force of law. ATF opinion letters are just like their opinion, man. All these letters really mean is the ATF is stating they would be willing to bring a case to court. But letters like this have the effect of law because 
No one is going to risk incarceration to prove the point. The Fed boys can bully people into almost anything by threatening legal action, even if they never actually follow through on it. So maybe it's just a bluff or political maneuvering. Maybe there really isn't any rational reason the honey badger brace is eviler than other braces. Maybe it's a complicated political plot hatched by career bureaucrats to influence the election somehow. Because deep state? But I'm loath to ascribe malice to anything which can be explained through incompetence, so I doubt there is any shadowy conspiracy afoot. So if the letter doesn't have any legal force, why do we care? Short answer? Maybe you don't. But the longer answer is the letter amounts to a threat to file charges, and no matter how confident Q is about being in the right, a court battle would be expensive and the discovery process could reveal trade secrets or maybe even unintentional violations in other matters. So of course Q will comply. They have mouths to feed and dags with precisely the right number of holes. So what should you do if you have one of the naughty guns? Well. You could chop it up with a torch. You could build the relevant parts into a legal configuration, maybe. But be careful, because there is some legally unexplored area here. If the honey badger was never legally a pistol, then you can't make it into a pistol by just attaching a compliant pistol brace. And you can't just split the parts up because of this neat little concept the ATF invented called constructive possession. That's this idea where even though you don't actually have the illegal thing, you do have parts you could assemble into the illegal thing. So having a bent up coat hanger isn't illegal, but having it and an AR-15 is constructive possession of a machine gun. Or you could just do whatever it is you did with your bump stock. But once you're finished, you should definitely visit the GOA link in the description to send an email to President Trump urging him to get control over the ATF right now. While you're at it, you should call your Congress critter and demand Congress begin investigations against the BATFE for violating due process clauses of the 5th and 14th Amendments by delaying Form 1 and Form 4 applications and for conspiring to deprive Americans of their constitutional rights under color of law. This is the way. Now at this point, I was going to sarcastically say something about how the BATFE would rather harass regular folks over arcane technical violations than to arrest the mostly peaceful rioters for possession of unregistered destructive devices because I just knew they weren't doing anything about the hordes of barbarians chucking Molotov cocktails around, except I was wrong. They aren't making breathless, pearl-clutching press releases about it, but the ATF has indeed been making arrests. It isn't widely known, but Molotov cocktails are specifically described as destructive devices in the NFA subject to a $200 transfer tax. And yes, if I ever had any discretionary income, I would definitely register an empty beer bottle as a DD. But independent of any state or local charges for arson, attempted arson, etc., mere possession of an unregistered Molotov cocktail is a federal crime on par with possession of an unregistered machine gun, silencer, or an anti-tank rocket. Come to think of it, wouldn't it also be constructive possession of an unregistered DD if you happen to have an empty beer bottle, some flammable liquid, and literally any scrap of cloth? I'll bet Kamala Harris has a lot of wine bottles in her house. She seems like a cats and wine kind of gal. <laughs> Not that there's anything wrong with that. It's just that it would be awfully hypocritical of her to advocate for authoritarian restrictions on guns if she had piles of unregistered destructive devices laying around her own home. I mean, that would be like locking up thousands of people on nonviolent marijuana charges and then callously laughing about her own drug use. But nevertheless, she has promised repeatedly to disregard the Constitution in order to suppress the right of the people to be armed. Despite her multiple public declarations of her intentions and the amicus brief Kamala Harris filed in DC versus Heller where she vocally opposed the individual right to bear arms, Facebook fact checkers declared articles written by Cam Edwards and Rachel Malone to be fake news because they were critical of Harris's position on gun rights. The articles were well sourced and Harris's opposition to the private ownership of arms is, of course, widely known. There is no rational way to claim inaccuracy in these articles. When a Facebook post is labeled as false, its reach is reduced. Because the Book of Faces uses the French company AFP to do its fact-checking, and AFP has received subsidies from the French government, and also many of its senior leadership are government agents, that means an 
actual foreign government is manipulating the American election process. For, for, for real this time. It means Facebook suppressed political speech to the benefit of Kamala Harris, and that means they have made an illegal contribution in kind to the Biden-Harris campaign, which is why the GOA has filed a complaint with the Federal Election Commission. The complaint alleges Facebook and AFP have violated federal law on multiple occasions by inaccurately labeling political speech as false. One of the complainants, John Crump, is director of the Virginia GOA and a former Facebook employee. He alleges one of his own posts was labeled fake news and hidden from users from simply linking to the amicus brief Kamala Harris filed in the Heller case. Now let's consider this for a moment. The articles written by Cam Edwards and Rachel Malone are well-supported opinion pieces. They are filled with accurate facts to support their positions, and they are right. Nevertheless, they are opinion, but it doesn't get any more factual or accurate than a simple link to a legal document. How can you claim that to be fake news? Does Facebook expect us to believe Harris did not write the brief? The simple answer is obviously yes. Or more to the point, they hope they can erase any reference to facts that are less than optimal for her chances of election. So far, I've managed to get through this piece without using the phrase Orwellian, but as cliche as it is, it's also an accurate description of what it means for a small group of wealthy elites to dictate to the masses what's, what truth ought to be. It's nothing new for the powerful to control information for their own interests. Hearst did it, GENBC did it, and the Zuck does it. But the 21st century has brought a democratization of information which threatened to overturn the old order of things. They could no longer control information as easily through a small number of outlets. Now, anyone can publish. And that means people can publish ridiculous opinions about gay frogs faking the moon landing. And they can publish fake evidence to support their theories about flat earth or whatever else. And that is a problem. Gullible people seem drawn to the most ridiculous ideas. But I would argue that a truthiness priesthood which intentionally fabricates and distorts the truth to push an agenda is even more dangerous. I don't have any good answers, but I believe transparency and free expression are good, and lies and secrecy are bad. I don't think using the government as a cudgel against these organizations is going to result in a positive outcome, but I do believe the government should not be supporting them or defending them in any way, and when a company gets large enough that it exercises near total control over a market space, it should be considered a monopoly and it should be split up. See. Facebook's ministry of truthiness wouldn't be nearly as troublesome if Facebook Instagram didn't control three quarters of the social media market space. And that's only if you're generously considering Pinterest and YouTube to be the same kind of social media. I'd argue that Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram are the only platforms with any appreciable market share competing in the same space, and YouTube is likewise the only platform competing in its market. Sure, you can post comments on YouTube or post videos on Facebook, but the core mechanics of what users do on the two platforms are distinctly different and they do not directly compete. Do any of you have an idea on how to address this problem that doesn't start with a fundamental misunderstanding of Section 230 of the DMCA? I'm not about to go off into the weeds about the myth of provider versus platform or any of that nonsense, but I will link to a great article that unpacks it all down there in the doobly-doo. In short, no, websites don't lose Section 230 protections based on whether they're a provider or a platform. Comment below. Whatever the solution to this problem is, though, I'm pretty sure it doesn't involve going to the local 5-0 about imaginary threats. An Uber Karen in Virginia reported a gun store for voter intimidation over an advertisement on Facebook. Minuteman Arms posted an ad for a sassy little 9mm AR thang with the caption, The election is just around the corner, and the Loudoun County Sheriff's Office determined it was not a threat. Duh. And don't get me wrong, I can see how a fragile, irrational, and paranoid person with violent tendencies could interpret literally any words in conjunction with a picture of a gun as an ominous threat, but that's kind of like seeing a sign on the roadside that says, last chance for gas, and assuming the person who posted it intends to kill you. Normal people read the ad and understand it's just playing on the understandable concern that guns like this might be harder to buy if more gun control is passed. Thankfully, there are grown-ups in the room at the sheriff's office, so the complaint was treated exactly as it should be. Except, 
maybe the part where the complainant ought to be fired from their position as a poll worker, and laughed at heartily by a room full of people. Australia, as everyone knows, is entirely peopled with criminals, which is why the entire continent banned guns. It is a prison colony, after all. I mean, I'm a gun rights extremist, but even I am smart enough to understand that you can't let convicts in prison have guns. So I don't blame them for that. But they might be have gone just a little too far by banning gel blasters. Honestly, I had no idea these were a thing, but apparently a gel blaster is like an airsoft gun, but even less accurate. And apparently it shoots these squishy little ball things, kind of like those Orbeez that were really popular a few years ago. But now you will need to be over the age of 18 and grovel before the almighty state for a permission slip to own a gel blaster everywhere in Australia except Queensland. It does make sense that a state named after such a legendary band would be the last Chad in a room full of pansies. In all seriousness, this is another example of how authoritarians think banning stuff is the answer to everything. The stated excuse from the ruling class in the penal colony is that gel blasters look like real guns, and people have been pointing them at strangers and sometimes even shooting them. But that would be already illegal, right? I mean, pointing something that looks like a gun at someone should be considered the same under the law as pointing an actual gun. Uh, the person on the other end can't tell. And of course, you can't go around blasting people with gel or BBs or paintballs or even snowballs. It, it's called assault, and civilized people punish folks who do that to others. But you don't need to ban the things for everyone. And banning the things won't stop people from doing stupid things to other people. But there I go, preaching to the choir again. Man, I miss it when Australia was synonymous with badass. The FBI has released the Uniform Crime Report for 2019, and it's not great news for authoritarian control freaks trying to ban sport utility rifles. One thing that really stands out is overall homicide is down for the third year in a row, and rifles of all types accounted for less than 3% of the total homicides last year. More people were killed with blunt objects than with rifles. In fact, Almost twice as many people were killed with bare hands than with rifles, and four times as many people were stabbed to death than shot to death with rifles. This is a serious problem for control freaks because it makes it harder to prove a law meets the standard for even intermediate scrutiny in the courts. Now, I maintain, as you might imagine, that strict scrutiny must be applied in every case regarding issues pertaining to the Bill of Rights. But in practice, many courts have applied intermediate scrutiny in 2A cases. So the fact that rifles account for such a minuscule share of total homicides makes it hard to argue bans on certain rifles would be remotely effective at furthering the important government interest of reducing homicide. Uh, bear in mind, these figures include lever and bolt-action hunting rifles, not just the scaly black ones. Don't get me wrong, I think it would still be unconstitutional and morally repugnant to deny military arms to the people even if there were conclusive empirical data proving that such a ban would bring an end to murder altogether. Liberty is more important than security. I have spoken. Adriani won last week's t-shirt with this lovely vignette. The Sickles are a wonderful family. Ma was a warm-hearted person and a great cook. Pop was not much for conversation, but he could tell a lifetime of stories by just one glance. He was always a little intimidating, and I never actually spoke to him as we were always in large groups. Ma and I discussed this in the kitchen, and she was surprised by my confession. She said, come on, I'll introduce you. She took me by the hand and led me into the living room, where I could see him sitting close to the fire. Unfazed, fire embers floated on his leg as he polished his 12-gauge. His chair started to turn slowly as he sensed us coming near. As he locked eyes with me, Ma said, I want you to meet Pop Sickle. That was not at all what I expected for the phrase, meet Popsicle, and I think he earned this shirt. If you would like to win a free t-shirt too, post a comment containing the phrase, I keep this handy for close encounters, in the YouTube comments, and I will arbitrarily and unilaterally choose a best one for a free shirt from our Teespring store. Keep it PG, and I might just read it in the next episode. Well, friends, that'll be rounds complete on two and of mission. I hope you enjoy watching these things because I sure enjoy making them for you. If you want to help us keep bringing you banger content like this, please support the folks who support us. 
Not only does TNVC.com carry a wide selection of low-carb, fat-free, non-GMO night fishing products, they also have mounts, lights, and all sorts of other gear you need to make you the bump in the night. And if you want to support us more directly, you can get fly shirts in our Teespring store just like this. I love you. Well, you could chop it up with a torch. You could build the relevant fart. Relevant farts. <laughs> you gotta build those relevant farts. I was doing good too. Oh, I saw the roll. Oh, na na na. Put my headphones up. <laughs>